we're all on the same page, let's get started and go to the next slide. Um, just let me start with an overview of where we're going. I've got a five-part presentation and one of these <laughs> slides. Um, some background noise, uh, if everybody could just make sure you could um, uh, mute your uh, phones, that would help here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what economic gardening is in case all of this is new to you and I'll show you some uh, deliverables so you have a concrete sense of what the CEOs are getting. And I want to walk you through the CEO experience which is more about the process. And then the most important thing uh, for you today is, is your role. And finally, uh, we'll look at some outcomes in the Kansas program from previous communities and CEOs that have been through economic gardening. The program, I uh, lost track, but we're probably at least five years old in Kansas. So um, what is economic gardening? If you've heard the term at all, you probably know it as a grow your own companies program. If you haven't heard the term before, um, it's an entrepreneurial approach to economic development. And we call it gardening approach as opposed to hunting or recruiting approach to economic development. But the real differentiator is the focus on stage two growth companies. Let me show you a couple things about that group of companies. There's one category of business, stage two growth companies, that is producing an outsized proportion of the jobs. We define stage two as 10 to 100 employees and one to 50 million in sales. In Kansas, those numbers drop down to six start at six employees and 650, uh, 650,000 in sales, uh, mostly because of the rural aspect of Kansas. So this data that you're looking at here is from youreconomy.org. It happens to be for Kansas during the period 2015, 2016, but it doesn't vary much by state or time period. Down in the second section where it says jobs by stages, Count down four blue bars down where it says two, that's stage two, 10 to 99 employees. You'll note that group produced about 40% of the jobs in those two different years. And that, that group is typically going to be about 10% of all companies. That ratio, 10 to 40, holds pretty constant throughout all the states. So what we learn is that a few companies, the stage two companies, are really important. They're punching way above their weight in job production. Here's the second thing we learned. Most jobs are created locally, and I know this chart's a little hard to read, but the information's in that big blue swath. This is where jobs are created for every state in the union, listed down that left-hand side. The colors of brown on the right are the various ways that out-of-state companies create jobs. They move in, they expand, they franchise, those kind of things. Um, the darkest brown is actually the recruited uh, jobs and companies coming in. The blue is jobs created by local companies. And if you would draw a line down from that 80% mark, you can see that in every state, locally created jobs runs between 80 and 90%. Most of the jobs are created locally, whether you do anything about it or not. So, Besides the fact that these 10% of the companies are producing roughly it's between 35 and 40% of the jobs, why do we focus on these stage two companies? First of all, nine out of 10 businesses in this country will never hit these thresholds. So those numbers serve as, as a valuable screen. If you have sales of a million dollars, it shows you've got proof of market. Second, if you've hired 10 people, you have some proof of management skills. These companies are generally the ones exporting innovation and bringing new wealth into the community. A key difference with these companies is that they are past the survival stage. They are now dealing with growth issues. We're not doing business plans for someone who already has a million dollars in sales. So what is it that these growth companies need then? As it turns out, one of the biggest needs is information. And as it turns out, economic gardening is very good with information, particularly information that increases sales. I wanna show you some of the tools we have and the types of information that we can deliver. So these are deliverables. 
These next few slides are about the high-end, sophisticated tools we use to generate strategic information. The core is database research. Our market researchers subscribe to a number of commercial database services. They can find market information and competitor intelligence, company information, information on individuals, industry trends, do all kinds of custom research. These commercial services are like the internet, but better in that they're highly targeted to the business issues listed above here, and they cost a lot. Um, Geographic Information Systems, GIS, is a computer mapping of data, and you, you may be familiar with simple versions of GIS during the political season when all the red and blue counties are shown on TV. On this slide, um, the map on the upper left is a simple location map of customers within a 30-mile radius. Um, you can see something called a weighted center, which means it's the place closest to all the customers on the average. Uh, on that upper right, that's a heat map of product sales. Tells you where you're selling most of whatever it is you're selling here. On the lower left, that's a heart disease death rates across the country. A little scary to look at that. On the lower right is location of oil wells and their depth. So, so you can see the variety and the sophistication of the mapping capabilities that we have. Digital marketing covers a number of areas, including search engine optimization, that's getting your site uh, as high as you can in the rankings. Um, it also includes market research using the keywords, uh, paid advertising on Google AdWords, social media, especially LinkedIn, which is really great for targeting individuals in B2B businesses, um, research on competitor sites. The chart to the right compares one of our company's digital marketing efforts to its competitors. So that red column in the middle is our client. They were doing very little. And the green column to the immediate left is a major competitor. They were doing a lot of digital uh, marketing things right. Uh, two other tools <clears throat> are listening posts and network mapping. Listening posts are designed to monitor uh, both consumer chatter, chatter excuse me, and signals of change. It's our belief that sales are easier to make in volatile environments than they are in stable environments, so we look for volatility. Network mapping, there on the bottom on the other hand, allows a CEO to see connections between websites, LinkedIn sites, Twitter accounts, and it's <clears throat> very useful for finding centers of excellence. In addition to all these corporate level tools over the years, we've teased out five common, we call them classes of business problems that keep businesses from growing. We then develop frameworks for how to think about these problems that allow us to get to the root, root causes when we're working with businesses. So let me touch on these five briefly. Core strategy is built around the idea that all businesses are made up of this formula, profit margin per item times the volume of that item. If you're a commodity business, then profit margins are thin, you know, 2 to 3%, so you have to make it up in volume like Walmart does. And the rule for winning is to have the lowest price like Walmart does. If you have some competitive advantage as a niche, then you can increase your margins, and you don't need that Walmart volume. So the rule for winning in this quadrant is to continually innovate to keep that advantage because your competitors are trying to commoditize you. Second framework is market dynamics and that three-way tension between the customer and the competitors and your company. We do a lot of market research in these areas, including customer needs and problems. We do competitor intelligence about operations and strategies, and we also do a lot of work with company business models. A good business model is just as effective as a good marketing plan for increasing sales. Innovation is the third framework. If you're competing on price, then you need to innovate efficiencies in your process to reduce your costs. If you're competing on differentiation, newer, better products, then you need to innovate in what you sell. But in both cases, you need to constantly innovate. The question of how much to innovate and when is determined by the stability or volatility of your environment. Stable markets, Management's focused on exploitation, making existing products cheaper. In volatile markets, management 
needs to focus on exploration, creating new products. So the fourth framework is temperament. Given that bosses have temperaments, customers have temperaments, competitors have temperaments, employees have temperaments, uh, this issue becomes important in how you get things done. We see temperaments like preferences. It's, it's the same as, uh, it's, it's like whether you're right or left hand. I'm right handed, so I'm going to use that example. It's not that I can't do left handed things, but I'm much better at using my right. So we talk about temperaments as filters that give us four different outlooks, and that all of those pers perspectives are needed. And what's more, getting people slotted right so their preferences match up with the job needing to be done solves a lot of your HR problems. Temperament language affects how you communicate with your employees, how you influence your peers, and it's a big factor in customer satisfaction. Final framework is qualified sales leads. We use a very disciplined process. It starts with building the profile and then finding out who is in that universe and then who is actually in the market today and then finally finding the right contacts. The difficult step here, as you might imagine, is number three because we are looking for public signals of people and companies who are about to buy something. This is the area where we look for prospects who are undergoing change. So let's take a quick look at the CEO experience as they go through the program so you get a feel of what it looks like if you're the CEO. If I'm a CEO running a second stage growth company, I'll probably first learn about the program when a local extension agent or a economic development uh, person contacts me, encourages me to participate. I'll receive a package of information explaining the program. I'll go online, I'll submit a, an application, and that would get reviewed. And then, assuming I meet all the qualifications and am notified that I've been accepted in the program, my next contact is going to be with the team leader on a discovery call. This is a one-on-one. -on -one. The team leader will ask a series of questions about my background, the history of the company, its customers, about current issues facing the company. The team leader will try to focus down on one or two issues that matches up well with the skills of the team. So discovery calls uh, notes will be written up. Coaching comments are added. I put those in there and then forwarded to the team for review prior to the call. This one hour call, uh, this team call is to ask clarifying questions. Uh, to clarify unknown terms, determine what publications they read, what marketing efforts they, uh, that they currently have, what those look like. Um, this is also a time to change the focus if the CEO wants to. But at the end of this call, the list of questions to be answered is drawn up with the approval of the CEO, and then it's assigned to the specialist. So timelines for getting the information back and, and reviewed or established. And typically, this team's going to move very quickly, completing their work within a few weeks. <clears throat> this is a screenshot from our greenhouse software that we developed. It shows research work that we have posted for the CEO. On that left-hand side, if you can read it, you can see uh, the deliverables that we produced. It starts out with keywords for Google Ads, and there's a competitor report and a market report. So. And I'll, I'll use, read down that list. The CEO is going to have access to this secure site as well as the team uh, working on the engagement. As the work progresses, the specialists will check in to explain the work they've posted. The team leader will do a mid-course check-in, make any corrections to the work. And at the end, there's a closeout call and then a verbal survey, and, and that's followed later by a written survey. Was the work useful? Were the team members helpful? Program administrators are encouraged to conduct their own job and revenue creation surveys at the end of the year. So how do we work? It's important to understand how we work with a CEO. It may surprise you that we don't consider ourselves counselors or consultants. Counselors work on the assumption that the client knows little about business, and, and the counselor's job is to explain the basics. Our clients are good business people. They're already running growth companies. Consultants, on the other hand, are deep in an industry and they provide recommendations. Our clients are always going to know the industry and their business better than we will because we work with all kinds of uh, industries. 
The economic gardening team works as an extension of the CEO's team. Our job is to research the information that will help the CEO make decisions. We'll also bring those five frameworks for troubleshooting root problems that we talked about there. Think of the team members as navigators, not pilots. We're going to provide critical information, but we're not going to fly the plane or make decisions. So this is the most critical part, and that's your role if you participate in the program. <clears throat> Let's take a, uh, we've got an open mic if somebody would just check and make sure uh, that you're muted. Um, hardest part is actually finding the stage two growth companies. Uh, a DMD done in Bradstreet list is a good starting point. You can see employee and sales data. It also helps to find partners from the private sector that are likely to have business relationship with these growth companies. So bankers, accountants, attorneys, and sometimes it's worthwhile checking in with the state university tech transfer offices because someone in your town may be uh, trying to commercialize an innovation or uh, have innovated something by working with the university labs. Growth companies can be located anywhere, but office and industrial parks are very common places to find them. You might look on the major hiring sites like Indeed and Monster, if you're not familiar with those, those are big aggregated sites, and screen for your hometown to see if anybody is gearing up for growth. Um, LinkedIn is another good place to watch a conversation and the actions of companies in your town. Um, enlisting partners, a simple way is to enlist the support of uh, these partners to schedule a lunchtime presentation about the program. It's easier to attend the free lunch than it is to take off time in the afternoon to listen to the idea. You have about a half hour to explain the program, provide marketing field kits, and those are available uh, from us. We have uh, half a dozen things in there that you can use. Professionals often have a self-interest in seeing their clients grow. A growing company is good for your partners. But there's also the community aspect, more money coming into town, meaning public services, amenities like police and parks can be funded, more money flows to charities. Um, the whole outlook of the community improves when there are jobs and, and good prospects for the future. So everybody has a, a, a stake in this. Once the potential companies are identified, then that same lunchtime process works for particularly these, uh, you've got really busy CEOs here. You're gonna have the opportunity to show the value of having a short-term high-end research help to find new markets. Um, this is the place to use the materials and the marketing field kit to show the deliverables, the case studies, the testimonials, if you're making a cold call uh, at a company's headquarters, you can also send out uh, videos and frequently asked question sheets, uh, all of that in the marketing kit. So uh, the National Center, as I said, has a marketing kit, has a number of items which can be mixed and matched according to the situation. You can, don't have to use all of them, pick what makes sense. Um, there's an introduction sheet, there's a link to a video, there's case studies. There's an article about economic gardening. There's an overview of the frameworks. There's testimonials. There's backstory on the program. You have lots of collateral material to present your case that we have prepared. We also have samplers in there of the deliverables so they can look and see real market research reports and see what that looks like, see if it makes sense for their company. There's GIS maps in there. Uh, there's digital marketing reports, there's listening posts, uh, network maps, all these things that we discussed about. It's very important to get uh, the right kinds of companies uh, into the program in order to have success. Um, in rural areas, as I mentioned, uh, we dropped the sales threshold down to 650,000K and uh, up, up to 50 million, and we dropped the employee threshold six to 100 employees. Uh, but the company must have grown three of the last five years, and occasionally we adjust this for economic uh, recessions. Back in 2009, 10, uh, nobody was growing, so we adjust it for what's going on nationally. Um, they also need to sell to external markets. Um, it's preferable, I think, that the company compete on innovation, but it's not a requirement. If they compete on commodities, we still work with those folks also. Um, you can ask questions about whether the company's got formal growth plans. That'll give you some indication whether they're oriented that way. Uh, does it need market research, uh, qualified sales leads? 
but the program is not designed for retail or local market types of businesses. Um, and it's not a good fit financially stressed businesses. There, and, and, you know, there are other programs for these areas. We're just not geared to do that. Uh, we're, we're not in the save me business. We're, we're in the help me grow business. I um, want to close out and give you a sense of outcomes uh, of a well-run economic gardening program, the one here in Kansas. Uh, they're a model for us, uh, particularly in, in rural areas. Um, so I don't expect you to read all this list, uh, but it's a list of Kansas communities that have already participated in the program. We start out there with Little Marienthal, if you know where it is, out in western Kansas, population 100, right there on the Colorado border. Go, runs all the way down, all of those communities, Wichita is at the bottom there. We've had a, a total of 91 engagements to date uh, in the, uh, the Kansas program. Um, this is just a sampling of some of the interesting companies we work with. I am always amazed at what people are doing out in little small towns. Atchison Industries makes a uh, concrete sealant, which I actually ended up buying some from, from for my own driveway. Um, Pento makes uh, composite uh, tracks to lay down in front of your tires to get out of snow or mud. Uh, Flip House is a uh, marketplace for buying billboard space. Uh, porch Swing, and I love this company. They make porch banners and they sell them all across the country, bringing money back into Marysville. Um, rest of these, uh, LED lighting, uh, three-wheel motorcycle retrofits, uh, grill guards for deer, weld inspection technology. There's a lot of stuff going on in Kansas. Uh, that, that, until you get down you know, at the local level, you don't realize all this is happening. Um, this is a testimonial pulled off uh, from Port Swing. It said, our cost of marketing went down 59% over the year prior. Our sales are up almost 40%, and that was almost a year ago. We continue to grow by 25 to 30%. Thank you, Economic Gardening, Port Swing. Uh, let's take a look at some Kansas outcomes. Uh, these are overall uh, outcomes if you add all the programs together. Uh, the EEG participants had a 11% job growth rate compared to the Kansas average of 6%, almost double. EEG participants had a 23% income growth rate uh, compared to the Kansas average of 4%. These numbers are John uh, Gendron, who's online, uh, gave these numbers to me. We, it, we don't uh, do the surveys. Uh, we count on a third party to generate these numbers. So uh, that's the uh, end of the presentation. If you're interested in more details about the National Center, you can go to this website, and I realize that's a, a long uh, address on there, but the, the key to it is edwardlow.org. If you get to that site, work your way down to Economic Gardening. Um, you can contact me if you like. You can contact uh, John Jenner at Network Kansas. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop and answer any questions you might have about our program. Thank you so much, Chris. Those outcomes are truly um, astounding. Um, John Gendron, I have unmuted you if you'd like to uh, put anything in, and otherwise I'm going to open it for questions. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate you making time to share today. Uh, I did want to let those on the phone know that we have received grant funding from the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City, and we are currently interested in identifying uh, one or two more Kansas growth companies to utilize the remaining grant funds, uh, but there will be other ways that CEOs are able to access this program at no cost. So if you would like additional information, please let me know. I'd be glad to share. I've got all of your phones muted. Um, if you would like to pose a question, um, either do it in the chat box if you or if you're not able to join us, and otherwise, I'll un um, please unmute yourself and ask your question.
So while they're thinking, um, Chris, I was struck, um, you gave us some really concrete ways to find out who these companies are um, that might be growing. I think we have the idea that we know who's at work in our communities, but I found it really interesting, your idea, um, if I remember correctly, of going on monster.com or on in Indeed and seeing in the, our local communities who's hiring. Um, that's really enticing to me. And then, yeah, the, go ahead. ahead. I, I was just gonna comment on that. Uh, it's always interesting to me is no matter how small the community is, there's always somebody uh, thinking way out there in their garage and their kitchen or whatever that they just are not aware of. One of the things about growth companies is they, they're, they don't join the typical organizations. A lot of times they're so busy, they, they may not be a member of the Chamber of Commerce or you know, the, the kinds of place you would normally go look for businesses. And their, their connections are uh, sometimes odd when you're in a small community. They may have a connection back to KSU or something like that. And so it, it, even though you, know, you think you know all of the people in your town, there's usually some people out there doing some interesting stuff that you may not know about. The reason we use those, uh, uh, those uh, job boards is that if they're growing, uh, they give off this public signal and we, we search for public signals is that we need to hire, you know, somebody that uh, can weld titanium or something like that. It, it's usually, it's not a, a clerk job. It's, it's not something that's generic. It's usually something specialized. And that gives you a hint about what's going on uh, with those companies. Great. Anybody else? The one thing I would like to mention, the reason I threw Marienthal in there, is I've actually driven through Marienthal, um, and it's a very, very small town. There was actually a, uh, um, it was wheat farming, uh, but it was a company, it was corporate, and they were doing, raising organic wheat, and they wanted to sell to bakeries on the East Coast that, uh, we're organic bakeries, and so we did a lot of work in tracking down, you know, uh, uh, potential places to sell out there. But uh, I, I, I like that because it shows that it just does not matter how small the town is. Uh, there's, there's always somebody out there doing something unusual um, that brings money into town and that falls into that uh, stage two growth company. Uh, so, so we work from, you know, the biggest, from the Wichita's right down to the Marienthal's in terms of community size. Most of our work in Kansas has been in towns probably under 2,500, easily under 5,000. Uh, although uh, later on, that, that was the initial requirement, and then later on we expanded it to the metro areas. Fantastic. Well, if there's no other questions, and, and I will point out that um, the recording will be found on the K-State website probably this afternoon. I've posted that to the chat um, box, but I'll, I'll send it out, the link to the recording out to everybody that was on this call and everybody that signed up. Um, it's at the K-State Research and Extension Community Vitality section under business and entrepreneurship. Um, our call for next month is on the first Friday, which is April 6th at 9.30 a.m. And Becky McRae with Small Biz Survival will be our speaker. Um, if you've never heard Becky before, um, you're in for a treat. She will speak on innovative rural business models.